Are you ready to scale and outsource your business? Okay, let's go. Welcome to the Outsourcing and Scaling Show. I'm your host, Nathan Hirsch, a show where we talk about everything Amazon, Shopify, e-commerce, and digital marketing. Let's get started. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Outsourcing and Scaling Show. Today, my guest is Matt Hagberg. Matt, how are you doing today? I'm great. How are you? I am great and I'm excited to talk to you. I know you're a system and process guy, all inside business operations. Um, For those of you who don't know, Matt is a college dropout who jumped around different industries before finding a home in the pest control business, created a business that was spreading to over one to three locations every year before eventually exiting out of the business, selling it. He then got into e-commerce, growing an e-commerce business from zero to six figures in three months before finding ClickFunnels, and now is a business operation consultant. And we're going to talk all about that, um, and I definitely want to hear your story. Before we do, let's take a step back. What were you like growing up before the pest control business? Were you a straight A student? Were you a rebel? Did, did you know you wanted to be an entrepreneur? It seems like you've, you've been doing that since a young age. Yeah, so um, I kind of went back and forth. Uh, I was a straight A student for a very long time. Um, when I got into my teenage years, obviously, I wanted to rebel a little bit. So things got a, a little rocky around that time frame. But um, right. straight A student, everybody told me, you know, just uh, keep keep getting good grades, jump into college, you can do whatever you want. Um, people kept telling me, you know, you should be a lawyer because you can, A, you can do it, and B, it pays a lot of money. And that was really a big driver for me. Um, there was always, like when I was a kid, I would go around the neighborhood trying to mow lawns. Like I was always trying to be out there doing something um, entrepreneurial and some, making money in my own way. Um, but it never really dawned on me. And I didn't have anyone in my life to show me that that was actually like I could make a life out of being a business owner. Right. Um, so I just kept on that path of just getting good grades and uh, eventually going to college and trying to become a lawyer. Um, It was in college when I realized I didn't want to do that. So uh, rather than spending uh, 10 to 15 grand a semester to basically just go to school and party, uh, I decided to just uh, bail out and uh, just started working different jobs in different industries to figure out what it is I really wanted to do. Um, Even at that time was doing small entrepreneurial things, but again, didn't have anyone to tell me like, hey, you can actually turn that into a lifestyle. So with that pest control business, what goes into expanding different locations? I mean, you have to be doing something right. You have to have your your processes down. I mean, you can't be at all these locations every day managing everything. Talk to me about that because I feel like a lot of entrepreneurs don't create a business that they can just replicate replicate over and over and over and have the same thing happen in different places. Yeah, definitely. So um, the first step was really figuring out uh, in, in our one location, what is it that we wanted to accomplish um, and step back and figure out a the steps that it takes in the day-to-day operations it takes and b who we need in order to fill those in so that was really what we did was um, in the first year it was me building a team of people that can just do the day-to-day stuff and i would oversee them but then the next step was now i need someone to replace me so i started looking for people the, the good thing is we've um, we've always been blessed with finding good people and bringing them on so um, one of my first managers was a guy I'm still friends with today, um, and he runs his own pest control company in the same area. Um, but it was really about figuring out what needs to get done consistently um, and then just hunting for those people and putting, putting them to the test to figure out if they can do those things day in and day out and then putting them in place before then stepping away and going and starting another uh, location. We had made the mistake of not finding the right people before uh, expanding. And I then had to go back and clean that up and figure out how to do that the right way. Um, So that was a little bit of a, um, that was a a whole other issue that came in. Um, But really that's what it is. Just stepping back and figuring out like what it is that, um, that your team needs to be doing while you're gone and then finding the people to do those things. How much checking in are you doing with each location? And and then we'll move forward. We'll talk about e-commerce, but how how much are you calling them every day? Are you getting weekly reports? How does that work? So uh, it really depended on um, the people that I found, but 
every day we talked. Um, it was, but when we talked every day, it wasn't like, Hey, give me all of, tell me everything you did in the last eight to 12 hours. It was, right. um, Hey, here's the key, you know, key performance indicators, the KPIs that we need to pay attention to, because those are the things that are kind of like the pulse of what's actually going on. Um, and those would be anything from like number of sales. We, we created uh, no, lost customers that we had. Um, and then the uh, people, it's really a culture thing as well. So it was like, how many people are we hiring? How many have we fired? How many walked away? Um, what kind of complaints do we have that are coming in? Those types of things. Um, so it was performance and operations, but also the people. Um, how are people feeling? How do they respond to us? Um, are they happy? Do you do things that are fun? It was really... We had to figure out how to balance culture and operations at the same time. And are those the same KPIs you, you have your, your clients do even today, or does it change depending on what industry they're in? It, the, it changes on, depending on industry, but not as much as you would think, uh, in my experience. Um, every industry obviously has, for example, if I'm working with a supplement company, um, they're different, their KPIs are a little different um, based on sales, based on they might need a smaller staff. Uh, those types of things, but there's still a culture and there's still an operations. And so you, no matter what, there's still those factors that uh, play a role. So you joined e-commerce, you had some success early on. W what is it like structuring an e-commerce business? Um, it was actually very similar. Um, so as I put this together, it was my first time doing it. And so as I was building it and putting it together, I was obviously doing it all on my own. Um, and then I stepped back and I looked at all the different pieces of what it takes to run the business on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. And then, so I listed all of them out. And this is one of the things I teach my clients is I listed all of them out and I put them in these four quadrants and the four quadrants are, um, in the bottom right, I have things I hate doing and I'm bad at in the bottom left quadrant. I have things I'm good at, but I hate doing in the top right quadrant. I have, things I like doing, but I'm bad at. And then in the top left quadrant, I have things I'm good at and I love doing. And so that bottom right quadrant of things I hate and I'm bad at, that was the first thing I got rid of. So then um, I jumped into, uh, this was before I knew you, so I didn't know free up was uh, an option. So I jump into thing, uh, Upwork and a couple other places and I just start looking for people. My biggest thing was order fulfillment. Um, it was a very mindless task that I could give to somebody because it was literally just copy and paste in a drop shipping situation. So um, that was the first thing I gave away. Uh, we were doing 100 125-ish orders a day. So it was a lot of work that I was able to take off my plate and, and hand over. But then piece by piece, I just followed that quadrant and figured out what to give away at what times. Um, so that way I can focus on building the business. How do you get out of that mentality that, that hiring just creates more work for you? Cause I feel like a lot of people, they go into it. They're like, all right, I hate doing these things. I'm going to hire someone. But then at some point they're like, Oh, this is taking too much time. I'm just going to do it myself or their systems aren't yeah. strong enough. What do you teach your clients to get over that? Yeah. So in a lot of cases, what I do is I, um, I take a step back and I show, I show the client, uh, what it would really cost for them to not put that person in place. So I tell them like, how much money are you wanting to make per hour? And usually their answer is somewhere between like the 50 and $500 range or whatever the case may be, depending on the industry and the client and things like that. So um, I ask them, well, how much is this particular task making you per hour? And they say, well, probably 10 to $25 an hour. And I said, okay, how much is, would it cost for you to actually give it to somebody? And with like free up, um, it could be anywhere from five to $25 an hour. And I said, well, so what you're telling me is you're making less than you want to make per hour. And if you hired this person to do it for you, you could actually make more per hour and do less work of it. So is it really worth the loss of money to not train someone to do this? And when you train them the right way, then you never have to train them again. You just do it once and you never train them. And in a lot of cases, with like Loom and Zoom and all of these, uh, we're in an, an age where technology is just on our side and business owners. You can literally just make standard operating procedure videos and put them in Google Drive or Dropbox or whatever. 
And anytime you hire someone new and all they're doing is a simple task, you just send them to that video. And anytime they have a question, they can just reference the video on how to do something. We were talking before that, that you have this process that you put your clients for you, uh, through, and I feel like we kind of started to go into it. Why don't you walk us through that process of a client comes to you, they're trying to scale their business, they're trying to figure out, hey, do I need internal employees? Do I need a VA? Do I need high-level freelancers? You walk us through that. Yeah. So the first thing that we do is um, kind of what I did with my e-commerce business and what I've done with um, pest control and other businesses as well. So uh, first thing I do is we write out everything that it is that gets done in a day, in a week, in a month. And then we, uh, if you're just the entrepreneur and you're by yourself, then what we do is we do that four quadrant um, concept, that exercise. And we figure out first what it is in that uh, you, you're bad at it and you hate doing a quadrant. And then we start, we set that aside and we say, okay, these are the first things to knock out. So oh, then we take a step back and we, we start talking about what it would look like if you have a VA versus people on site. And I've done both and it really depends on the industry. So for example, in pest control, you can't really have VAs because you need technicians to service homes. You need your customer service uh, staff can be um, remote, but you have to have on site staff as well. So it really depends on what you're trying to fulfill. However, on the e-commerce side, a lot of that can be remote uh, because if you're doing order fulfillment, customer service, whatever the case may be, unless you're doing order fulfillment on your own in a warehouse, you don't really need on-site people. So we walk through that concept of what do you want your operation to look like and what are you comfortable with? Um, as I've grown, I've realized I actually enjoy having people on my team on-site because there's this culture that it creates and cultivates that I enjoy being a part of. Um, but there are key things that if I can't find them locally, especially um, we talk about free up having access to people who um, have more sophisticated skills, uh, whether it's design or whatever the case may be, those people aren't as readily available locally. So being able to hire someone um, remotely can be a, a better access. So we walk through that whole process and then we just start interviewing. We re and then the biggest key to interviewing is people don't trust their gut enough that people will sit down or they'll be on the phone. I always recommend doing um, a, a Zoom interview, something face-to-face, -face, even if it's digitally face-to-face, -face, because it really gives you an ability to kind of read the person and see if your gut is telling you that this would be a good addition to your team because people discount their gut way too much and they consider uh, the resume way too much. Um, and I, we, I figured out a balance of both um, through all of my businesses and I help my clients to do the same thing. Uh, so that way they can build a business. They actually have fun running rather than feeling like they have to babysit people uh, to do a job instead. And how does this process change? Let's say if it's a, a newer business that's just having success for the first time that needs to hire their first person to someone who might have a bunch of people already working with them, but it's not organized enough and you need to really yeah. go in and restructuring. How does that process change? So, um, I actually uh, feel sorry for the people who are already further along that realize they need to change something because then it gets painful. Um, I, I run into this situation with a few different clients um, and the, the basics are still the same. You still have to figure out like what needs to get done and uh, who needs to do it. But when you've had people, the first step you have to do before you start interviewing people is you have to back up and say, okay, are the people that I have right now actually accomplishing what it is that uh, we need to get done? And if I were to interview them again, would my gut actually tell me no, that this person's not a good fit? So there are times where you then have to back up and assess your current situation. And if you don't have the right people in place, you got to go through the hard task of getting rid of those people. And it's not like, um, I try to, when I talk to clients, I try to tell them firing people isn't being mean. If you're wanting to fire them, it's probably because neither of you enjoy being there. So you're really releasing both of you from hating your life for eight to 12 hours a day. So do it, rip the bandaid off and tomorrow you'll breathe a lot easier. Um, so that, that's really the big difference is you got to make some hard decisions on your personnel, uh, right off the bat. Any other firing tips? Because I feel like we don't talk in, enough about firing on this <laughs> podcast. It, it's obviously that yeah. subject that no one really wants to, to hear. But any other tips for someone who, who might be scared out of their mind or they're afraid that someone's going to blow up or hurt their business or, or any of the common fears that entrepreneurs have? Yeah. 
um, there's, it's really a, a mental shift for the business owner um, as far as what firing is. Again, it's not like, it's not like you're going in and being mean and hopefully you're not a mean person, as, you know, as a business owner. Um, what we really did was anytime someone came into our business, uh, one of the things we told them was we want, when you come in, we want you to learn as much as you can possibly learn. Not just because we want you to be good here, but because we want to set you up for success in your own life in general. And so when you show people that you actually care about them beyond just showing up and doing work for you, then they see that you have a vested interest in them becoming more than who they were. So when I train managers to, or business owners to hire people, I always tell them, look, the, while you're interviewing and while you're training people, always keep this in mind, your goal, your job is to help that person be better tomorrow than they are today. And if you can do that, A, they'll do more in your business uh, tomorrow, which means your business is going to succeed. And B, they will love you for doing that. And they're never going to hurt your business if they know that you love them. So that's the, that's the first step in it. The second step is um, make sure you're setting them up for success. Sometimes when you think you need to fire someone, you need to back up and say, okay, did I actually train them properly in order to do their job? Did I give them the tools they needed? If the answer is no, you should actually be firing yourself. You need to be taking, you need to put in the effort to actually train those people. If both of those things are there and they're still not succeeding, then you need to have a conversation with them and be honest about it. Don't, there's too many people that dance around the conversation and then no one knows where the other person stands. And it really just needs to be an open conversation of, and a caring one that is, Hey, this is what the expectation is of what your role is. Um, this is what we need from you. What do you need from us in order to help you accomplish that? When you're on the same page moving forward, then at that point, if they still aren't performing the way you need, then you have the right to say, Hey, look, this obviously isn't a good fit. Um, it's not, you've proven that you had, that you care for them over and over again. So I've actually had people, there's a, um, I love to tell this story. So there's a, I had a manager that, um, she, that she had some life changes that happened in her life. And for a couple of months, I could tell she was just miserable. So we sat down, we had a conversation about it and come to find out before she had gotten the job, the reason she got the job with me was because she had just had a kid. And she needed to just find a job so she could have income. Um, the child's father was no longer in the picture. So she was on her own trying to make money. But before that, she was trying to go, go to school to be a, a special education teacher. So we worked through some things. Uh, it got a little better for a couple months, but it just reverted right back to her being miserable. So finally, I sat her down and I was like, look, I'm, I'm going to let you go but it's not necessarily because you don't do a good job. It's because you're obviously miserable here and you need to go back to school and you need to do something. You need to do what you really want to do. And at that point she was in a point where she could. So she did, she went back to school. She hated me at the moment. She was miserable. She didn't like the fact that she was getting fired. Um, but a couple months later she called me up and she invited me and my wife to her wedding uh, because, wow. yeah, because she realized like, getting fired was actually the best thing she could do, she could have done because she went back to school, she got her degree, she started working uh, as a special education teacher and she loved it. And so she was completely happy. Um, and it, it, if it wasn't for the fact that I actually spent time trying to care for this person, I never would have known that. And if you can spend time caring for people, you don't need to worry about firing them, you need to worry about is is you being here good for both of us? And if it's not, then maybe you need to go somewhere else. I think that's a fantastic point. Cause I, I think one of the questions I always get asked is about risk of hiring. And, and you're right. If you come from a place where you actually care about the people and it's about building relationships, that percentage doesn't go to zero, but it goes way down. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Talk to me about the, the whole investment thing. Cause I think that's where a lot of people struggle as well. Let's say you make a bad hire and you, you catch it on week one. Okay. You haven't made that much of investment, pretty easy to part ways. Now, as you get further and further along, you've invested money, you've invested time, other resources into them. How do you figure out whether you should keep trying to go into someone and turn them around or get them back to where they were before versus just cutting them off and starting off with someone new? Yeah. Um, 
there's a couple different things that you'll hear out there in the world. Like, uh, for example, don't throw good money in after bad. Do you really throw more time and money into keeping them around and training them? But then you also have those stories of like, uh, some made a mistake and it cost the company $3 million. Do you fire them or do you look at it as a $3 million investment into their training? Um, and that's always like a, which, which one do you choose? Right. Uh, so the way that I usually look at it is, did they actually learn from the previous mistakes? If they're constantly learning and changing and growing and they're not making the same mistakes over and over again, and they're not a cancer to your culture, then they're a good investment. I mean, when you think about it, when you think about your own investment into yourself, into building your own business, you make mistakes. When you're a solopreneur, when you're starting your business, you made mistakes. The question is, did you learn from them and move on? If you didn't, you are not a good investment into your own business. But if you did, you're a good investment into your business. So use that same philosophy. If they're learning, if they're growing and not making the same mistakes, and I'm going to repeat again, if they're not a cancer to your culture, um, we've had plenty of people that did their job just fine, but they were a cancer to the culture. And that's why we got rid of them because they'll just bring other people down. And when other people are on their way down in, in the culture and morale, then usually their performance goes with it. Matt, this has been great. What, what else did I miss? What other tips can you share with the audience before I, before I let you go? Um, honestly, I, I think that's as far as scaling and, and finding the people that you need, those are the good basics. Um, it takes, it, it takes experience. It takes practice, just like anything, uh, interviewing, hiring, firing, all those things take practice. You get better at them with time. Just keep caring for the people that are coming into your world and you'll usually make the right decision. Love it. Thanks so much for joining us. Where can people find out more about you and what are you most excited about for the rest of the year? Um, they can find me on Facebook. Uh, Matthew Ryan is, uh, is my name on Facebook. Um, just connect with me. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, for the rest of the year, I'm actually looking and excited about expanding, uh, M and M coaching, which is our business operations and marketing, uh, coaching program. Um, so yeah, just bringing on, you know, new clients, people who are really passionate about growing their business and scaling their business. So that way, uh, I love, to see people scale their business and the excitement that it brings for them. So awesome, Matt. Thanks so much for joining us. And I'm sure we'll be in touch for the rest of the year. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Hey everyone. Thank you so much for watching. Did you enjoy this content? If so, click like, leave us a comment and subscribe to our channel so we can continue bringing you great content all about hiring.